my name is Marie Mulvey Roberts and I am absolutely delighted and honoured to have been invited to give this talk on Mary Shelley in Bath and Bristol. And it was in Bath where she worked on her most famous novel Frankenstein. And this year we're commemorating the bicentenary of when Mary Shelley was officially revealed to be the author of the novel. Now when it was published in 1818 it came out anonymously and it was assumed it had been written by a man. Her future husband, Percy Bysshe Shelley, was a prime candidate. In 1821 her name appeared on the title page for the first time and this was for a French translation. Two years later, in 1823, and a year after her husband was tragically drowned, her father William Godwin helped bring out another edition of the novel in two volumes, and this was the first English edition to include her name. So this is the time and place to remind ourselves of the importance of this writer to the city of Bath. Here on this slide at 5 Abbey Churchyard and to commemorate the important act of creation where there is now a plaque. And here it is. So I'd like to ponder briefly why it took Bath City Council so long to agree to having a plaque. According to Christopher Frayling, um, Professor Frayling, he'd urged his friend Angela Carter, and a fellow Bath resident and one of our best-known novelists of the 20th century, he urged her back in the 1970s to write to the Bath City Council with a request to erect a plaque. The response was, though, that the novel was associated more with Boris Karloff than with Regency Bath, so they dismissed the idea. And as you can see, he, along with Andy Warhol, inspired our book cover. More recently, Sheila Hannan, the director of the South Bristol-based theatre company, Show of Strength, started the Frankenstein Walks in 2016 to commemorate the bicentenary of the genesis of the novel in, in 1816 when Mary Shelley started writing it. And these walks have done wonders in raising awareness of the links between Mary Shelley and the city. Sheila also carried out some illuminating research on Mary Shelley and her circle to really create a, a psychogeography of Bath, which really transforms the way we now see the city. So why did Mary Shelley come to Bath in the first place? And what did she achieve? Well, starting with the second question, she worked on producing a draft novel from two notebooks, the first of which had been pur pur purchased in Geneva, where the story had started. And what, what's so significant about the importance of Bath is that this was where a short story, a tale and some fragments, was turned into a novel. Of course, it all started here at Villa Diodati, on the shores of Lake Geneva in Switzerland, where Mary Shelley had been visiting Lord Byron, accompanied by Percy Shelley and her stepsister, Claire Claremont. And this was in the summer of 1816. Now you might be wondering why I have a photograph of Michael Foote here, the ex-leader of the Labour Party, in front of Villa Diodati. And the simple answer is that I took the photo, so there's no copyright issue. So instead of a portrait of Byron, we now have the author of a book on Byron, called The Politics of Paradise, A Vindication of Byron, by Michael Foote. Because the weather was so inclement, in that summer of 1816. This was a result, incidentally, of a catastrophic volcanic eruption on the other side of the world. Byron's guests decided to stay indoors and entertain each other by inventing ghost stories. And so Frankenstein was born. And I use this word born deliberately because the reason why Mary Shelley was visiting Lord Byron in Switzerland was to do with the birth of a child rather than a novel. Her stepsister Claire Clermont had got herself pregnant with Lord Byron's baby. And I, I use that expression rather unreservedly. She'd actively pursued him for sexual relations. 
she was rightly concerned that the father would not face up to his paternal obligations. And she travelled to Geneva to see him, supported by Mary Godwin, as Mary Shelley was called then, and her lover, Percy Shelley. Now, after returning to England, the three of them moved to Bath, and because it was sufficiently far away from London, where Mary and Clare's father, William Godwin, lived, thus they wanted to keep Clare's pregnancy secret. She resided at 12 New Bond Street, and this is where Mary went to care for her, and from where she reported back to Byron the news of the birth. So Frankenstein is, is also, of course, about creation and secrecy surrounding the birth of a monster. And that was at a time when Claire's pregnancy would have been uppermost in Mary's mind while she was writing this. She was writing her novel only a short walk away from at, at Five Abbey Churchyard, which we saw earlier, and she developed this, this shortest piece um, that she'd brought back from her from Switzerland, with her from Switzerland. And it's thought to have been the creation scene, that pivotal part of the novel when Victor looks at his creature and is horrified by what he sees. So the significance of what took place in Bath was that a tale was birthed into a novel. And I think it's significant that the timeline of the novel, which consists of letters written from Captain Walton to his sister, spans the gestation period of nine months. Well, this moment of creation I mentioned is portrayed in the novel as, as the funneling of a lightning strike. But that doesn't appear in the novel itself. According to the plaque, Mary Shelley attended lectures on electricity given by a Dr. Wilkinson in the nearby Kingston rooms. Conversations she'd overheard between the romantic poets Lord Byron and her future husband, Percy Shelley, about galvanism, a form of electricity, was the spark for her waking dream which prompted the story of her scientist hero, Victor Frankenstein, to bring the dead back to life. And this process is described in the preface to the 1831 edition of the novel, and predates her visit to Bath. But, or rather the process does, you know, not, not the preface. But if we, we go back further to the time before she even went to Switzerland, there was another spark which might have been struck to inspire her monstrous story, and that was her visit to Bristol, a place where the monstrosity of slavery had proved to be so lucrative, and which I believe helped shape the direction of the novel, particularly in how Victor Frankenstein's creation can be seen to represent an African slave. And we can see here um, a stage play adaptation of the novel, which portrays the creature as a black African king, as you see. Now, Mary Shelley had been staying in Bristol in 1815, only eight years after the slave trade had been abolished. But slavery itself was very much still in existence, and the movement to abolish it was the hottest topic of the day. Mary and Percy had been reading books about the trade the year before she started writing the novel and her visit to Bristol is likely to have been a reminder. The year before, in October 1814, Percy sent Mary a long letter with an extract from the Times on the sh newspaper on the shocking conditions endured by captives on the slaver caravans in Africa, saying, See where I've marked with ink, and urging her, he says, to stifle your horror and indignation until we meet. The same year had seen mass protests in Bristol against the continuance of the slave trade by the French. While she was in Bristol, Mary Shelley might have seen black servants. While she was staying in Clifton, the residences of many retired sea captains of slaving ships, or she might have witnessed ex-slaves working on the docks in the centre of the city. Compared to Bath, Bristol had a rather besmirched reputation because of its mercantile interests. In Jane Austen's novel Emma, Jane Fairfax obliquely refers to offices in Bristol for the sale of human flesh. This is in a conversation with Mrs. Elton, who immediately jumps on her remark as having, she says, a fling at the slave trade. 
So just as I've linked Bath Villa Diodati around the theme of birth, in regard to Claire and Byron's um, baby daughter Allegra, now I want to link Bristol and Villa Diodati in terms of slavery. Now, at the time of Mary Shelley's visit to the Swiss lakeside house, another guest arrived, who happened to be a slave owner, and he was a Gothic novelist. His name is Matthew Lewis, and he wrote one of the most influential Gothic novels called The Monk, which had been published a couple of decades earlier. And perhaps more tellingly for the point I'm making, he was also the author of a journal which described in great detail his role as the owner of two Jamaican slave plantations. Matthew Lewis had recently re returned from one of them during a tumultuous time, the threat of a, a slave insurrection which he narrowly avoided. It could well have involved killing the white masters, the overseers and their families, and was a reminder of the dangers that vengeful slaves could wreak in retaliation for the barbaric cruelties they were subjected to. Lewis discussed his concerns about being a slave master with Byron and Shelley, and the day he left Villa Diodati, Mary talked about her story to Percy. Might his visit have reminded her of her visit to Bristol, which had once been Brit Britain's premier slaving port? So what is the evidence to link Frankenstein with slavery and to see Victor's creature as an African slave? Well, the most obvious connection took place in Parliament when an impassioned debate took place on the immediate abolition of slavery. The Speaker was George Canning, the Foreign Secretary and leader of the House of Commons, and he used the novel to oppose this motion on the grounds that slaves needed to be gradually prepared for freedom and should not be freed immediately. On the 16th of March, 1824, he declared, In dealing with the Negro, sir, we must remember that we're dealing with a being, possessing the form and strength of a man, but the intellect only of a child. To turn him loose in the manhood of his physical strength, in the maturity of his physical passions, but in the infancy of his uninstructed reason, would be to raise up a creature resembling the splendid fiction of a recent romance, the hero of which constructs a human form with all the corporeal capabilities of man and with the thews and sinews of a giant, but being unable to impart to the work of his hands a perception of right and wrong. He finds too late that he has only created a more than mortal power of doing mischief, and himself recoils from the monster which he has made. Such would be the effect of a sudden emancipation before the Negro was prepared for the enjoyment of well-regulated liberty. Well, Canning's speech was so powerful and influential that he even persuaded the father of abolition, William Wilberforce, to forgo his advocacy of immediate abolition of slavery and to revert to an ameliorist condition, in other words, to support the cause for gradual abolition and improve the living conditions of slaves, which would delay their freedom for around a decade. What has perplexed biographers is why Mary Shelley did not protest against the political use of her novel. In fact, she expressed pleasure that it had been mentioned by Canning. Most people seem to have thought, well, wouldn't she want immediate abolition? But actually, I think, no. Her father and husband and many of her circle were of the opinion that the manumission or the freedom of slaves needed to be gradual, or else they would wreak revenge on their oppressors. Mary and Percy had been reading about the horrific massacres of whites in Brian Edwards' account of the riots in St. Dominga, the present-day island of Haiti, in the Caribbean, where thousands were butchered in retaliation for unspeakable cruelties inflicted upon slaves. The year before Canning delivered his speech, there were fears of mass insurrection. In the wake of slave riots the previous year in De Demerara, part of British Guiana, 
involving te tens of thousands of slaves. So how is this theme of the vengeful slave reflected in the novel? Well, there's an episode in which the creature is carrying out unpaid labour by collecting wood for the de Lacy family. Um, and when he's treated cruelly by a member of the family because of his appearance, he retaliates by burning down the family home. And we can see a parallel here with how slaves, when they were mistreated, how they rebelled and would go on to torch the home of the master and then massacre his family. And the creature kills Victor's little brother, his best friend Henry and his fiancée Elizabeth. And this is because of the way he's been mistreated. So unlike the first Boris Karloff film in which there's a grunting monster, the creature conveys his viewpoint eloquently to his master Victor Frankenstein through which he reveals the depths of his humanity. He makes an impassioned plea to be treated as a human being. And this, I think, resonates with the slogan of the abolitionists and the, the uh, Wedgwood medal that was struck of the kneeling slave here, asking, am I not a man and a brother? So I quote from the novel, the creature says to his maker, his master, let your compassion be moved and do not disdain me. I was benevolent and good. Misery made me a fiend. Make me happy, and I shall again be virtuous. And then he goes on to say, slave. So it's reversed. So now Victor is described as the slave, because his master-slave discourse runs throughout the novel. He says, slave, I before reasoned with you, but you have proved yourself unworthy of my condescension. Remember that I have power. You believe yourself miserable. But I can make you so wretched that the light of day will be hateful to you. You are my creature, creator, but I am your master. Obey. Well, here we have the slave who now has the whip handle. The fear that when slaves were freed they take revenge en masse was the reason why manumission was slowed down in the belief that slaves needed to be educated and Christianized before they would be ready for freedom. But the problem was that the rebellions proved to be those very educated house slaves who'd been exposed to Christianity. And there seems to be a connection here with how Mary Shelley's creature has also been educated and exposed to Christian teaching through Milton's Paradise Lost, and yet engages in monstrous acts of murder. So I see the novel as connecting with the debates and controversies involving abolition around that time. The monster, in having been created from dead bodies, is essentially the living dead, and slavery was a living death for the enslaved. The creature has been named as the Frankenstein monster or creature, named after his maker, rather like slaves being named after their owners. He doesn't have his own name. And and also, at one point, Victor chases his creature throughout Europe, almost as if he's a runaway slave. The creature has a different skin colour, and his appearance causes him to be rejected and ostracised by those who meet him. And that's something that fugitive slaves would have experienced. Questions which Frankenstein's creature asks about his origins and identity reflect the the self-abnegation of someone who had been demonized by society. He says, My person was hideous and my stature gigantic. Slaves were often bred for size and strength in order to carry out their back-breaking work. And the creature goes on to ask, What did this mean? Who was I? What was I? Whence did I come? What was my destination? Now, these are questions continually recurring, but I was unable to solve them. And this crisis of identity would have been familiar to an African abducted into slavery, particularly as a young child, separated from family members. But where were my friends and relations? asked the creature. As he has discovered, 
It was con with considerable difficulty that I remember the original era of my being. All the events of that period appear confused and indistinct. A strange multiplicity of sensations seized me. Millions of Africans were seized and brought to the Caribbean and southern states of America by slave traders, many on ships owned by British merchants leaving the city's port on its triangular transatlantic voyages. As the creature dimly recalls, I walked. and I believe descended. And might this not be a reference to climbing down into the hold of a ship, into stinking, fetid conditions of darkness? Many slaves were held below deck for months before a ship sailed, waiting for more human cargo to be loaded off the coast of Africa. And eventually, when they embarked on the Middle Passage, this absolutely horrific period, at the very end, a slave might experience something which the creature recollects. I presently found a great alteration in my senses. Before dark and opaque bodies had surrounded me, impervious to my touch or sight, but I now found I could wander on at liberty, with no obstacles which I could neither surmount or avoid. So might this be referring to the feeling of liberation after being confined in dark, cramped conditions on board. And apparently as little as ten inches per person was the allocation on some slavers. It's not surprising that the mortality rate was extraordinarily high, with disease and deprivation, as a living being made from dead bodies. Shelley's creature provides an apt metaphor for how the living and the dead were chained together in the hold of a slave ship. And Victor appropriates the language of slavery when describing a brief respite from his sense of enslavement to this experiment in the creation of life, and to this monster he's created by confessing, for an instance, I dared to shake off my chains and look around me with a free and lofty spirit, but the iron had eaten into my flesh. So this quotation shows how slavery infected everyone. It permeated British society and all its institutions, both religious and secular, and it certainly left trails of its unholy footprints all over the city of Bristol. And here is a book which is a guide to precisely that. Nowadays, there's a much greater awareness of this dark legacy, which we can see mirrored through this interpretation of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And Bristol did commemorate 2015, the time of her visit. Um, and certainly in um, 2018, the uh, cities of Bristol and Bath commemorated the publication of the novel. And this year, in 2021, we're acknowledging how she was acknowledged on the cover of the novel for the very first time. Well, when I was an undergraduate studying English literature back in the 1970s. Frankenstein had not been included in the curriculum, though it was something that I wanted to study. But how times have changed. Now it's taught in schools, colleges, and universities. And I included on a, a course on slavery here at the University of the West of England, in fact. And the novel has so much to teach us about the dangers of science, the mistreatment of those who are ostracised by the society, and so much more. So, in the wake of Black Lives Matter, protests in Bristol and around the world, not forgetting the toppling of the Colston statue, is taking on a new relevance and a new context. So what does the future hold for Mary Shelley and the West Country? Well, there are exciting plans ahead, a Frankenstein Museum in Bath. Sheila Hannan's entertaining and informative Frankenstein in Bath walks will continue. And they are um, 
You can find out more about those from her website. And you can also find out more about Mary Shelley's links to Bristol and Bath through two films I made for a MOOC, that's a massive open online course called Writing the West, Writers of the Southwest. And this was run by Professor Robin Jarvis at the University of the West of England. It's a free online course and you can follow it at your own pace over a period of four weeks. So each week's devoted to a different writer. The first week focuses on romantic poetry, the second on Jane Austen, mostly in Bath, the third um, on Mary Shelley, which is what I look at, and the final one on Thomas Hardy. Um, so that's Professor Rick, uh, Bill Greenslade and um, my colleague um, Dr Jill Ballinger looks at um, Jane Austen and Professor Robin Jarvis at Romantic Poetry. Um, so um, I do write about um, the connections between Mary Shelley and slavery and Frankenstein in uh, my book here, Dangerous Bodies, and, and a little bit in this literary Bristol book, Writers in the City. And there's some links there to um, a radio program for uh, Radio 4 on Frankenstein and religion. And I think that just um, illustrates how many different approaches and interpretations one can make of this novel. And that is what I presented to you today. So the slide I'd like to end on now is of some street art under the Hotwell's underpass, which is celebrating women associated with um, Hotwell's and Clifton Wood. And, um, and as you can see, third from the left, there's the figure of Mary Shelley, who's literally taking her place in the city. And I think in view of the subject of my talk, it's highly appropriate that she's depicted standing next to Ellen Craft, who was a freed slave. So I'm going to end there, and thank you all very much for listening. <laughs>